So uh, up next is uh, Dr. Duvalier. He has held the position of Professor of Neurology and Physiology and Head of the Clinical and Research Activity of the Sleep Rab Laboratory at the University of Montpellier, France since 2005. Dr. Duvalier is a member of the research group INSERM U1061 and coordinator of the France National Reference Network for Orphan Diseases of Narcolepsy, Hypersomnia, and Klein-Levin syndrome. He is author or co-author of more than 370 papers and several book chapters. We are very happy to have him here to tell us about some of the exciting research that is happening not only in France, but across Europe and the rest of the world. So thank you very much and welcome Dr. Duvalier. Good morning, everybody. Very pleased to be here. Hi. I know some faces. I'm very... Oh, I don't need that, probably. Can you hear me? It's better than here. So, uh, may I have the first slide? Okay. So, I'm very happy to be with you today to discuss about my perspective on IH and also probably, hopefully, uh, from uh, European colleagues uh, to discuss and exchange with uh, US colleagues today. So uh, I'm in Montpellier, as I just, uh, you can hear the, uh, the presenter. And I do have some conflict of interest with uh, some big pharma interest in sleep and mostly in IH and narcolepsy. So I want to start with the complaint, the clinical complaint of the patient, I think is the, the major key points. And there is often a misused terms in literature and in clinical practice and even in classification, hypersomnolence, hypersomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue. So I think we need to come back to the definition to be sure that we are discussing the same things. So hypersomnolence need to be divided by either being affected with EDS and or hypersomnia. Focus first on EDS is inability to stay awake during the wake time. But there's a lot of different phenotypes. Sleep attacks, mostly for narcolepsy. Naps could be long, short, with refreshing naps, with dream contents. Automatic behavior, feeling of daytime sleepiness most of the day. So the CBTH is very, uh, as we just uh, listened to, it's hard to do a mixed bag because the, the symptoms is very variable from one patient to another. If we want to assess this different sleep complaint, A, first you need good clinical interview. This is the best, better than scale or whatsoever the, the objective measurement. You need to spend time and to listen to the patient and also to look for the consequences of having this daytime sleepiness and cognition problem about uh, risk of car crash accident. But after you need to quantify to be sure of the diagnosis, and we will discuss that along with questionnaire, with sleep diary, with, uh, to record sleep with different uh, possibility. And at the end, you will have a etiology that may explain the sleepiness in the patient could be NT1, NT2, IH, or that sleep deprived drug intakes. A lot of etiology that may uh, explain your daytime sleepiness. As a second symptom is hypersomnia. It's a completely different story. It's increased need for sleep during at night, more than nine or 10 hours, depending on the different uh, survey or different um, uh, article in literature during the day, more than one hour, and mostly is during the 24 hours, more than 11 hours is huge, but it's of interest to discuss that later on. And it's often associated with sleep inertia. And again, you need a good clinical interview to separate what is during the weekday, the weekend days. Uh, there is some questionnaire. Uh, to look for hypersomnia, actigraphy, PVT, and we will discuss on long-term recording of EEG. And the etiology is IH, could be depression, not sure about that, drugs intake, long sleeper with a continuum of IH. And is more complex because these symptoms could be associated together. So I love to start with the complaint. 
And we did with Maurice O'Hayon several years ago, based on the US population, adult population, the best way to categorize these three major symptoms in general population. Excessive sleepiness related to quality of wakefulness, the naps, and the main sleep episode. And if you divided at least three times per week, at least two times per day for more than three months without being sleep deprived, you can go to different uh, prevalence. Uh, and is uh, for excessive sleepiness is 4.5, so it's not orphan disease at all. So it's better to go to good clinical interview and that contrasts with a poor sleepiness scale, very often used, and that sum up everything. Sleepiness is a plus above 10. I hate that, so we need to go to good clinical interview and to structure the good clinical interview that be able to separate what is hypersomnia, what is fatigue, what is EDS. Second step is to quantify uh, the complaint. You know this story about DMSLT, MWT, I will not spend too much time on it, but if you are with latency below eight minutes and at least two SRMs, is often narcolepsy. It's not always the case. You can be shift worker, you can be sleep deprived, you can take antidepressant that may mimic your narcolepsy phenotype. But in most of cases, it's okay. But for IH, it's not reliable. We will discuss that. So how to quantify daytime sleepiness objectively in IH. But the second issue, the second symptom is hypersomnia. There's two major questions often asked. How much sleep do we need? And how much do we really sleep? Easy question, but not easy answer. How can we be sure to answer that correctly. The sleep duration is mostly between seven and eight, but as you know, there is a lot of extreme normal variant. Below six hours is 15% of general population, depending on countries, but they, they claim that they are short sleeper, but mostly they are sleep deprived, because during the weekend days is not the same as during the weekdays. For a long sleeper, it's the same is very variable above nine hours, 10 hours, nobody uh, agree on the cutoff, the, probably depending on the age, could be also sex ratio on that. But it's, it's variable because some patients do not complain at all about daytime functioning where they are able to sleep as long as they need. So this is really long sleepers. But some patients complain about excessive quantity of sleep, but with still some abnormal daytime functioning that cannot be resolved if you increase your sleep duration. This is probably IH, at least a subtype of IH. And third point, and this is key, some long sleeper I what we call in France clinophile. So they overestimated the sleep duration that equaled the time in bed, but it's not at all long sleeper. It's just long time in bed. And it's very heterogeneous how to assess that clinically. Is it face-to-face, -face, by phone, by internet, by questionnaire? What about the wording? If you want to use actigraphy, PSG. The target population also, depending on the age, the gender, the, if there is a context of complaint or not of, uh, of hypersomnia. And do you focus on the weekdays, uh, the weekend days? the sleep duration just at night or across the 24 hours. So it's really variable. And if you read the literature, it's, it's really a mix up of many things. So it's hard to, to really be sure of uh, the prevalence of this problem. So we did with my friend Maurice Orion again, several years ago, the, within the same survey, uh, as you can see here, the sleep duration is uh, following a, a normal distribution. And above nine hours is 8%, so it's a very frequent issue. But if you as associated uh, abnormal data uh, functioning is 1.6% of general population. So it's not an orphan disease, or 1.6%. And if you look on the right part of the slide, the U-shaped curve for the sleep deprived, or at least the short sleeper below six or uh, five hours, they are less affected on quality of life than patient with above nine hours. So really, the sleep duration is key for 
uh, the quality of life. Second point, how to quantify this hypersomnia and excessive need for sleep. There is a, a different uh, possibility to do that. What we do in my lab is a complex story, but uh, is a bed rest 32 hours protocol. So they are in a bed one night, one day, one night. Uh, with uh, ad libitum, the objective is to sleep as much as they can. Uh, there is no light, a little light. Uh, they, they, uh, there is no external influences. They just uh, call the nurse if they want to do something, uh, to eat something. But there is very little interaction. And before we do the PhD and modify MSLT, modify because when they fall asleep after one minute, we, they, we wake up because we just want to quantify the sleep propensity during the day and not to change the sleep homeostasis uh, for the 32 hours bed rest recording. And if you do that, you can just, an example of the normal sleep uh, subject, you have a normal uh, night, you, hopefully you can see, uh, you will wake up at eight and after you will have a nap at 2 p.m. for uh, one hour, and after the second night is a little bit shorter than the first night because he did have a nap, so at uh, 5 a.m., as you can see, there is no more sleep. So it's 15 hours for this guy. An IH subject, is he, he will fall asleep more quickly, as you can see, uh, is, and he wake up around 1 p.m after there is a long nap with two cycles, after there is another nap at 8 p.m., and the second night is quite long as well, so 26 hours. So it's complex to do that, but it's not very complex, it's time-consuming, I may say. So this is how to quantify the, com the complaint, EDS and hypersomnia, so long sleep at night. Let's move on to what is IH. IH is a rare disease with unclear prevalence because it depends on how we define IH, but is estimated to be uh, 20 to 50 cases per million of habitants. The age on onset is mostly uh, between 10 and 30 years old, but again, it depends on the criteria you want to use for IH, so it's not very clear. And the, the diagnosis is delay, and we often diagnose patient after 20 years old. Often family cases, but very poorly literature on that, unfortunately. Uh, but we like to say that it's one third to 50% of cases. I prevalence in female, this is very, very uh, uh, correct and shared by many different uh, uh, labs. And spontaneous remission reported in some patients, I think this is key as well to uh, explain to the patient that in some cases, it will, the, the clinical recursus will be okay. The current definition of IH, you're probably familiar with that, but I just want to list that, that I, item E is the same for every hypersomnolence disorder. Same for narcolepsy, type one, type two IH. Daily period of irresistible need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep for at least three months. I do not understand the reason why this is the same for IH and narcolepsy. And there is no hypersomnia here. There is no uh, sleep inertia in the clinical complaint. The number of SOREMs, few, fewer than two SOREM and MSLT, I'm not sure is really a, a good way to go because the number of SOREM is very variable time to time. So if the patient is 10 minutes and three SOREM, it cannot be narcoleptic, it cannot be IH. So he's, he's, he's a patient, he's a lot of complaints. So 10 minutes and three SOREM, what could be the diagnosis at the end? So I'm not sure that is, is good to exclude all of this subject. No cataplexy agree on that. For, for the diagnosis, so is MSLT below eight minutes, we discussed on that the total sleep time based on PHG or actigraphy. Unfortunately, in US, as far as I'm aware of, nobody do the PHD 24 hours because it's time consuming and the problem of insurance. We are uh, lucky to be able to do that in France, in Europe, some places as well. So in, in, 
as far as I know, in US, they use a lot of actigraphy, but uh, I will come back on that, but it's not objectively assessed. Actigraphy is just rest activity cycle, it's not sleep. And to exclude the item F is to exclude, to not better explain by other causes, the MSLT and the hypersomnolence, but which causes? Mild AHI, 10 per hour, mild PLMS, 15 per hour, I, I don't know. Is it uh, exclusion criteria? It's not list, I don't know. Uh, if it, the patient is depressed, it exclude IH or is comorbid condition? If it's obese patient, we know with low-grade inflammation, uh, is it an exclusion criteria? Uh, if they are taking with SSRI, SNRI? So I think it, we need to, to be more strict if we want to understand better the pathophysiology and the neurobiology of IH to, to understand more this exclusion criteria. So this is to be a, a lot of criticism, sorry to say that, but no, how where we can go, how can we improve that? On clinical assessment and on objective measurement. First, to go to the clinic. We develop a scale that assess EDS, hypersomnia, and sleep inertia. I don't want to say that is the best, but it's one that exists to assess the three major complaints of the patient. Long sleep at night, sleep inertia, and for sure daytime sleepiness, and is in the, within the scale, the consequences of having these symptoms on daily life, on social activity, on works activity, on uh, driving activity. So we developed that several years ago in my lab, and we compare that to controls. We, we develop also the narcolepsy severity scale is more strict and more specific, so we cannot compare to control because the symptoms in narcolepsy did not exist in general population. Uh, uh, example is cataplexy. But here, you can compare to control because it's just a question of threshold, a continuum. So we compare uh, this, uh, the, the result of this scale to control, and patients were compared to themselves after being medicated. And we define some cutoff. Uh, to separate what is IH, what is not, is not a diagnosis, is to quantify the severity of the symptom when you have been diagnosed. And based on that, we uh, were uh, lucky to find some uh, nice uh, hair uh, under the curve uh, to, for a discriminated IH and control with a cutoff of 22 and untreated and treated IH of 26. And the minimum clinical important differences is five. So it seems to be a reliable and valid tool to quantify, not to diagnose patient with IH. And recently, this year, we did publish the second study using the scale, and we confirmed that is in large population just on IH, not control, not narcoleptic in, to confirm that is, is valid at the scale, and to define some severity score that has been reported for insomnia, uh, for uh, restless leg, for depression. I think it's nice to, to quantify the severity of the symptoms. And we uh, quantify, and if you are more than 26, you are severe, so you need to be medicated differently than if it's a treated subject. Uh, it's some red flags to tell you that is, is not enough. And we were lucky to see that the IHSS is associated to, so the, the higher score on IHSS, the higher score you will have also on back depression inventory, and the lower score on quality of life on a Q5D. So I think it's a reliable scale, and I, I'm happy uh, if you are interested to use it in your, in your clinic. So the impact on IH is uh, key. I think uh, you have listened today and yesterday on the, the consequences uh, because of sleep inertia, because of sleepiness, because of uh, uh, decreasing the, the, the ability to, to do the routine. So uh, you need to manage uh, as best uh, as we can the patient. So um, how to best diagnose? MSLT cannot be the gold standards. Uh, David Wright did the first uh, lovely uh, uh, 
uh, test retest reliability of MSLT showing that it is not good, especially for IH subject, also for NT2. For NT1, I think it's not in this study, but uh, it's almost reliable. We did that in my lab as well, and Emmanuel Mignot did an, uh, the third study on the same topic. And it's not good because, first, the test retest is variable in terms of the latency and in terms of the number of SOREM. And also, you will not diagnose everybody with MSLT. So it's not a very uh, good way to redo that because even if you redo the MSLT, you can be without the diagnosis of IH uh, because the test is not good for IH. So this is take home message. I discussed with one patient today. Uh, it's not because your MSLT is not normal that you cannot be affected with IH. Actigraphy is the same story. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, lo I just uh, pinpoints three of them, uh, um, article uh, to assess uh, sleep-wake cycle in patients with hypersomnolence disorder. It's less expensive, it was accepted by the patient, but it may overestimate sleep and underestimate wakefulness during the day. So it cannot be a gold standard because it did not record sleep. And the clinophilia, you know, the clinophilia I just discussed uh, previously, um, that's a key issue, and especially for depressed subjects, they are not sleepy, but with the actigraphy, they tell you that they are sleepy. So we need to record sleep by extended PHG. We, uh, tomorrow, with new wearables, we can change, but right now it's not, uh, uh, we need to, to keep on uh, PHG, I do believe. So there is a lot of studies, if at least four, uh, one is from Paris, one is from my lab, one is from Bologna, so just European colleagues, and recently one from Japan. Unfortunately, uh, there's too much variability in inclusion criteria. Who will follow this 24 hours protocol? There is a lack of standardization about physical activity to invite the subject to go in, uh, in a bed or to have just a bed rest condition for uh, the wool uh, recording. Is, is it before the MSLT, after the MSLT? Is it ambulatory? Is it in the lab? So it's too much variable between these studies to, to uh, be homogeneous and standardized. The first, uh, the first one we did publish with Michel Billard a long time ago, but after uh, Isabelle Arnul from Paris did this nice study published in Sleep. But she include patients with complaint of sleepiness, but with MSLT below eight minutes or total sleep time above 11 hours. So you cannot make a good criteria if you include subject with already the criteria. So it's a circular reasoning. But that she, she did add control, and the median sleep duration in the control is 9.3 hours. And in IH is uh, quite variable because there is IH with long sleep time and without long sleep time. So why the cutoff has been decided on 11, 11 hours to include the patient in? So I think it's not really uh, correct to define cutoff if you predefine cutoff to select the patient that will be in the trial. And they, the patient have been invited to have two naps during the 24 hours. They can go out of the bed, out of the room. So it's not really standardized. And it's 20 hours mostly, not 24 hours, because at 6 p.m. they go out of the, the lab. Uh, my friend, Giuseppe Plazzi, did uh, also um, ambulatory uh, 24 hours PSG and after the MSLT, so the opposite direction as uh, Isabelle uh, Arnulf, and, but he didn't include IH with long sleep time and there is no control, so it's very hard to have cut off to say if it's normal or abnormal. A recent study, very short study, but nice, uh, well done, uh, uh, from Japan, there is no control, unfortunately, and they perform the PhD 24 hours and after the PhD and MSLT, so as, as in Bologna. And it's of interest because 
if I have, I have time, there is three phenotypes. The first one, subtype 1, is a patient who is very long sleep at night. Total sleep time is above 1,000. MSLT is 9 minutes, 0 SRM. Okay, so a long, long sleeper. Second phenotype is uh, less than 600 minutes, but 4.6 for MSLT, 0 SRM. So this is the IH without long sleep time. And third is the patient with a 900 minutes, MSLT 4 minutes, and 3 SRM. So this is quite narcolepsy type 2, but with long sleep time. So it's very variable. So we cannot put everybody in the same box with IH, so-called long sleep time. So based on that, there is no control again to define some cutoff value, but it's different assessment. Uh, unfortunately, no control. So probably it's not the same subject for the three phenotype. So we need to better diagnose patient with homogeneous uh, procedure between the lab. I think this is really a hope. Uh, to do the long term, is it 24 hours, is it 20, 20 hours, is it more, is it 32 hours, I will come back, what we do in my lab. Uh, we need to better define some cutoff to have valid biomarker, and also to define what is the condition that may mimics or being associated with IH, depression, a little bit IHI, what is the cutoff to be not affected, if it's 6, if it's 10, if it's 12, is it enough to say everything is explained by OSAS or not? I think it's subject to discussion. So what we do in my lab is this uh, uh, protocol. I already discussed that uh, to, with you. So in this Annals of Neurology paper several years ago, we include 116 subjects with uh, IH uh, based on on MSLT, 37, or based not on MSLT, 79. We include 32 patients with complaint of sleepiness but with depression, with AHI above 15, PLMS above 15, or obese subject, and 21 control without any complaints at all on sleep um, issue. And if you look at the slide, uh, we define some cutoff of 19 hours uh, among the 32 hours. If you go to the first 24 hours, is 12 hours for the cutoff. And I think it's of interest because it well define a phenotype associated with lower MSLT. I will come back on that in a minute. More sleep inertia and a little bit overweight. And the sensitivity is 19. 2% to diagnose IH. Specificity is 85. I like this uh, uh, correlation between the long sleep time and the MSLT latency. We like to say that it's separate topic, long sleep at night and to uh, sleep propensity during the day assessed by MSLT. But the more sleepy you are, the longer sleep duration you will have in my experience in this paper. So there is a continuum between the severity of sleepiness during the day and long sleep at night when they are able to do that. We did this recent uh, NICE study, I think so, uh, published in sleep several months ago. We reassess all our patients with the complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness and or excessive quantity of sleep. 266 subjects, drug-free, that follow the protocol, PhD, modify MSLT, and 32 hours bed rest condition. It is the modify MSLT because six months before we did the, the PhD MSLT to exclude narcoleptic subject in. So they are not sleep deprived, no cataplexy, no shift work, orexin is normal when we, we have some doubt. And in this uh, paper, we separate the long sleep time of 19 hours, as I told you, and we compare, it's a busy slide, sorry, but you can see that in the sleep journal, we look for uh, the clinical complaint the, and the PSG, MSLT, and the 32 hours bed rest specificity. 
And the three major associated uh, with the long sleep duration is young age, high sleep efficiency, high slow wave sleep, and MSLT below eight minutes. If we do the same with the MSLT below or above eight minutes, patient with MSLT below eight minutes is they are less complain of excessive quantity of sleep, higher sleep efficiency, higher increase of total sleep time. No association at all with BDI or with BMI. And what we do, I like this slide, is in, in the paper, we separate patient as a function of the complaint. Uh, we are clinicians, we first need to do that. Complaint of isolated excessive daytime sleepiness, complaint of isolated excessive quantity of sleep, or complaint of both excessive daytime sleepiness plus long sleep duration at night. We do the protocol and we separate we categorize patient as a function of the results of MSLT and long sleep duration. So patient can be affected with nothing, 59 subject, MSLT uh, above eight minutes and long sleep duration below 19 hours. You can be with isolated objective EDS, isolated hypersomnia or objective EDS plus hypersomnia. And if we exclude subject with two SRM, after you can exclude subject with a medical condition, obesity, with depression, after you can exclude subject with AHI above 10 per hour, uh, PLMS above 15 per hour, so you can, we can discuss you know, where uh, the exclusion criteria as we discussed uh, at the beginning. And sleep efficiency, if the sleep efficiency is not good, if it's 70%, can we buy the diagnosis of IH? That needs to be discussed. So at the end, we started from 266 subjects, and we go to 71 subjects with typical diagnosis of IH. Mostly female and young age, 24 hours, 24 uh, of age. And I think this is of interest if we, if we want to understand better the pathophysiology, the biology, the genetics, uh, and also to go to personalized management. So that can be discussed, but I think it's a nice uh, uh, flow chart of what the starting point to go to the end. If we want to go to the last uh, symptoms is sleep inertia. I think it's really frequently reported in IH subject, but very poorly defined. It's just good clinical interview, but after, if you want to do some research, how to be sure of, it, of the presence of sleep inertia in terms of the frequency of the issue, the duration, if it's five minutes in the morning, is it enough to buy it? Do we need half an hour? Do we need one hour? Is it uh, not need to be present at least three times per week? And also the wording of what is sleep inertia and not fatigue in the morning, so we define that in IHSS with three questions related to sleep inertia. And in this study, we uh, did the PVT. I know that David Rye did that as well with Lynn Trotti, and I think it's a nice way to go. And we did a complex PVT study because we did that four times for this study. 7 p.m. the night before, 7 a.m., just to quantify sleep inertia compared to the night before, because there is some variability uh, between subjects. 7.30 to be sure that it still persists or not for at least uh, 30 minutes to, to report on sleep inertia. And 11 a.m. to say, normally it's gone. It's supposed to be gone uh, four hours after. So we did that in 62 subjects with IH drug free and 140 subjects, non-IH, could be narcolepsy or that uh, complaint of sleepiness, but at the end there is no objective uh, diagnosis. Insomniac patient as well may be in. So we, I want to focus just on lapses, but you can also go for different uh, 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 assessment of uh, PVT. David Dean just work a lot on that. 
So we just selected three uh, outcome measure, but the most uh, frequently used is uh, lapses. So sleep inertia is more frequent in IH subject, more than half of them, but in, in, in the non-IH subject is 43 sub percent of subject. So when it's not specific at all of uh, IH. Lapses increase, as you can see, uh, at 7 and 7.30 a.m. as a function of sleep inertia severity, as you can see here, under red and uh, the black. And the, the, the blue bars is patient without any complaint. And it's regardless of sleep drunkness and regardless of being affected with IH or not, unfortunately. So it's capture the sleep inertia, but not the sleep inertia within the IH uh, spectrum. But PVT is reliable and objective measurement of sleep inertia, and I think it could be helpful to improve these symptoms for the follow-up. So the next part uh, of my talk is to focus on the perspective for the classification. There's a lot of disorder associated with hypersomnolent. We discuss that a lot. Depression, obesity, all that shift work, ADHD, substance intake, long sleepers. But only four are central hypersomnolence disorder. So currently, the ICSD3 criteria selected eight classification, eight, eight category. So for sure, NT1, NT2, IH, KLS need to be in. But what about the four other? Hypersomnia, hypersomnia due to a medical di disorder. Why hypersomnia and not hypersomnolence? There is no EDS, just long sleep because of hypersomnia. Is it due to medical condition? But the second box is associated with psychiatric disorder. It's not due to psychiatric disorder. What is the, the di difference, why there are some differences, and how to diagnose it to be sure that there is some causality. For insomnia, there is no more primary, secondary insomnia that did not exist. Why that exists still for hypersomnia? Insufficient sleep syndrome, is it central? For central hypersomnolence disorder. And due to medication, is it central? You take medication that exists. I don't want to say that did not exist, especially insufficient sleep syndrome, but why is in the category of central disorder of hypersomnolence? I don't know. And what about the cutoff? Uh, and to be sure to reassess this subject uh, after correct management. So I'm not sure that is need to be in. It's very uh, complex to put that in the same boxes. Uh, one example, we discuss about obesity, we discuss about depression, so if it's IH with obesity or depression, just two examples, is it due to medical condition or to psychiatric condition, or is it IH still? So I think it's very confusing, and I, I'm not sure it's very helpful uh, to, to go ahead. So if we wanted to keep NT1, NT2 on IH. No time to discuss this long slide, but I think you know that. But I believe, we believe in Europe that there is a continuum, NT1 and NT2, NT2 and IH with normal sleep time, so just based on the MSLT, and IH normal sleep time with IH with long sleep time as a continuum as well. And IH with long sleep time, with, sleep, with long sleeper. And if we continue with NT1, NT2, and IH, I'm not sure that we will find good biomarker in the next few years. So we need probably to, to split. But how to split if it's a continuum? It's very artificial. We need to keep that in mind. I like this slide, is Michael Torpy did it. Uh, uh, it's, there is my name, but it's a mistake. It's uh, Michael Torpy's slide. So it's almost the same as I just presented uh, before. It's a different uh, way. Uh, with narcolepsy, there is uh, cataplexy or axin deficiency. And IH is mostly with uh, long sleep duration, zero serum. But, you know, uh, for NT1, NT2 is mostly bad sleep at night, refreshing naps, sleep paralysis, sleep hallucination. But for 
IH with the continuum with NT2 is unrefreshing NAP, the sleep inertia, and the spontaneous remission. And for all of them, for sure, there is excessive daytime sleepiness, even if I do not like this April scale. And I think it's of interest to keep that in mind for the continuum and the criteria, because we know that uh, NT2 can develop NT1 if the patient will develop cataplexy, it could remit, and if you do and redo some tests, you can have SOREM or no SOREM, so it could be IH. IH is the same, could continue, could remit, and could be NT2 if you redo the MSLT, and there is SOREM that, that uh, occur. But is it really change of category? The same subject, same complaint, same, so it's just the test. So the test is not good. This is a reason why we need to change as I try to convince you, hopefully. So this is based on the diagnosis we did propose in Europe. So it's just not my view, it's hopefully the view of uh, some colleagues. And we wanted to change a little bit, not a little bit, but uh, to change the classification because of the different problem I just mentioned to you. For narcolepsy type 1, type 2, is it really good? We do a lot of LP, you know, uh, in my lab, uh, like in other labs, but not a lot of labs do that in routine because it's complex, it's time consuming, it's costly. But so to define NT1 and NT2 based on orexin, nobody do orexin in routine, so it's not very good to continue to, to go there. So we wanted to go to narcolepsy spectrum with different certainty of level of certainty, depending of the severity of MSLT, below five minutes, more than two SOREM, uh, and not just two SOREM and more, is more than two, so three, four, five, to be sure of the diagnosis if you didn't do the orexin measurement. And idiopathic hypersomnia, or the spectrum, is for long sleep duration objectively assess. And in between, some patients exist with a complaint of daytime sleepiness, but no SRM, no long sleep duration, and we like to call that idiopathic EDS. It's a new name that's not good for insurance, blah, 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 but if we never change something, we will keep uh, the same classification for decades. So we uh, hopefully can uh, Go ahead, and we did propose the, the dif different level of certainty for excessive quantity of sleep for IH as definite IH or probable IH, depending if you are lucky enough to do the long sleep recording. If you cannot, it could be IH, but it's less strict in terms of research perspective. It's different to do to clinic and to research. Uh, and this may explain why there are some differences between labs. And for idiopathic uh, EDS, we also define some cutoff. So it cannot be below eight minutes uh, and SOREM, if not, it's narcolepsy. But patient with uh, five minutes and zero SOREM, patient exists. It's not the same as to sleep 24 hours a day. So I think it's, this is this level one, so with certainty that exists, this patient exists. And there is uh, level two is for a patient with MSLT below, uh, sorry, between eight and 12. It's based on clinical experience, it's not based on um, uh, scientific level, why 12 minutes and not 13 minutes, not 14 minutes, but we decide that for level two, for probability to be affected, and it could be REM. If one example is 10 minutes, it's 3 SOREM, what that exist? So far right now in ICST's three criteria, this patient cannot exist. So we define this category also to diagnose patient and to give some medication. This is another story for the medication, but to help them. And the objective to do that is to better understand if hypersomnolence may reflect a brain circuit dysfunction. Everybody were lucky to see orexin deficiency in NT1, but in NT2, in IH, in KLS, in other category, what is wrong in the brain to explain the symptoms? Nobody knows. We did 
uh, costly study uh, in 100 subjects, 94 to be precise, and we did measure within the CSF uh, the monoamine, the metabolite, and trace amine in drug naive, enfin, drug free subject. Patient may be IH, NT1, NT2, complaint of sleepiness without objective assessment. We call that NSH, so non specified hypersomnia. And we look for a lot of biomarker from the serotonin pathway, dopamine pathway, norepinephrine pathway, and we find almost nothing, unfortunately. Uh, so, the no biology of IH, is it a deficiency in waking system or an excessive uh, of uh, sleep system? There is a lot of studies down uh, on histamine level, as an example. It's still controversial. Some did report some change. I'm not sure about this change. We did measure the telemethylhistamine, a more stable uh, metabolite, if we, we find nothing. And we uh, worked together with David Rye on the GABAS activity, but is, uh, we didn't find the same results, probably because we did not select the same population, as I tried to convince you that there's a lot of different population uh, that may be called IH, but also because it's not exactly the same experiment, so we do not know if GABA uh, stuff is really abnormal or not in this population. We need a better assessment first about the diagnosis and second to go to the biomarker. And I have just two slides to go to the end on the medication intake for IH. Since uh, 2021, there is nothing. And hopefully, recently, there is the XI wave, just in US, not available in Europe, unfortunately. But before that, what about the medication we can use to treat IH? We did this review with one of my, my fellow, uh, Elisa Evangelista, that review everything you can propose, but it's almost the same to treat EDS in IH as in narcolepsy, to treat EDS. But what about sleep inertia and long sleep time? There is almost nothing except a recent study you're probably aware of, it is a complex study, not time to... Did you listen to this study yesterday to go fast? Yes, so I will go fast. Um, so it's uh, the primary endpoint on April sleepiness scale go down on the open label study and especially uh, uh, the patient randomizes the control group go back to almost the baseline level for April sleepiness scale. Of interest here is works in patient with long sleep time without long sleep time, even if very few were included in, and mostly from Europe, the phenotype with long sleep time. It works in female and in male, once nightly, two, twice nightly, and patients still manage with stimulants because it was some, for a part of the population, an add-on therapy. So it works for all of these different phenotypes. This is of interest. And of interest, they use also the scale we developed in my lab several years ago, IHSS, and of interest, it's follow exactly the same as EPROS, but it's better than EPROS because it's not just EDS, it's EDS plus long sleep duration plus sleep inertia, and everything go in the same way. So it's nice to give drugs that may able to wake up the patient in the morning, to decrease the to total sleep time, to decrease the sleep inertia, and as other drugs can do to improve daytime sleepiness. So to conclude, we need a good clinical assessment. First, a good clinical interview on EDS, excessive quantity of sleep, and sleep inertia. Not to trust scale, not to trust uh, uh, different assessment. First, to trust your clinical judgment. PhD MSLT cannot be enough. And it's not, the test retest is not reliable, and you can diagnose patients with IH even if MSLT is normal. And to, to do the MSLT, 
that preclude to record the long sleep duration because you need to wake up the patient in the morning to do the first naps three hours uh, after the, the wake up. We need robust assessment of long recording with standardized protocol between labs. Hopefully we can do that in the next few years. Actigraphy is not reliable, it's nice for routine, for clinic, but not for research. And uh, the 24 hours recording and we, is the problem with the long sleepers. There is a problem with norm, with standards. At 20 years old, you can have a lot of long sleep duration at 20 years old, 25 years old. So we do prefer the 32 hours bed rest condition. I didn't focus on that, but why is one more night? Is one night, one day, one night. Why is better for us than the 24 hours? Is for the second night. Because if you record patient at 20 years old, you can wake up at 11 a.m. He can have a nap because they have nothing to do. He's in, within the hospital. But if he do that, the second night he cannot sleep. In IH, he will continue to sleep. This, the second night is key to diagnose patient with IH. Because we recruit some young subject, they can sleep above the cutoff of 11 hours without any complaint because they have nothing to do. In, in a lab. So we do prefer, is the reason why, I didn't mention that before, sorry, is the reason why we go to an extra night. Uh, we need homogeneous uh, IH population and clinic and neurophysiological biomarker to separate what is isolated objective EDS, isolated hypersomnia, and objective EDS and hypersomnia. Again, I think it's not clear in literature and even for myself, uh, what about the threshold acceptable to continue to say that a patient is affected with IH for PLMS, HI, macroarousal index, sleep efficiency? If uh, there is 10% of slow wave sleep, you, you buy IH? I don't know. It could be different uh, phenotype, but what about the age range for that? And the objective is to understand better the pathophysiology of IH to have better biomarker. And also, to perform some guidelines of management. There is just one drug available so far, very promising, but you, we need to go to personalized medicine, why not CBTH, I like that. We do that also to educate the patient, to cope with the symptoms, and we need follow-up. Hopefully you can use this IHSS, but also the comorbid condition about the depression, the blood pressure, the BMI, the, and et cetera, to have a careful follow-up of your patient in routine. So sorry I was a little bit long, so many thanks for your attention.